A lot of people ask me from where do I get a lot of my information on what are the recent things happening in the developer space or in the cloud part. And in this video, I want to make this video actually a part of a recurring theme or something which we can do where I would just sit down and try to review some popular subreddit. In this case, let's start with programming subreddit and take a look at what's all happening in today's week in this week in the programming landscape. Let's go. If you're new here, make sure you leave a like, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. This is free of cost and helps the channel grow. Well, of course, AWS is down is probably the most important thing which happened this week and the most critical thing as well. AWS actually wrote down a complete, I think, a full guide of what happened. And essentially they had some internal networking issues. But yeah, I mean, AWS was going down the second time this week after just another, you know, a disaster which happened in US East one the other day. So that was a big news and you would see a lot of other cloud providers going down as well. Impressive, but AWS at least this time was super communicative and not just uh, ghosting their service page for a couple of hours straight. And things in Log4j just keep getting worse there is another exploit which is discovered and not necessarily an exploit because this does not allow attacker to remotely log in which is again a uh, super worse remote control execution exploit which log4j had discovered but this one is actually interesting because this allows anyone to perform a denial of service attack which essentially means that you remotely can take down a java server which is running log4j and this begs the question right like the people have been asking that most of the community right now the security community did not really looked at log4j as a potential threat for entering a system or a you know a, a business or whatever you want to call it just because it seemed like a logging library the only fact that log4j actually tries to be a bit smarter than it should be as a logging library basically opened a huge amount of attack vector huge surface area of attack vector on that so we talked a little bit about log4j in in one of the videos i did in the past week but this just keeps getting worse so at this point probably if i'm a java developer i might as well just migrate to a simpler non uh you know feature rich library like log4j because right now the whole everyone's eyes is on log4j discovering new vulnerabilities trying to just read every single line and see how that can be exploited and plus yeah i mean it's good for the security part but it's overall bad because bugs like these are now released and they are just pretty much released in the wild it's not like these companies are getting time to fix and patch and upgrade it's all happening in real time so it's not probably a good idea to be sticking to a vulnerable library right right now especially if you are someone who is lazy to upgrade and keep up to date with you know these news on a daily basis and of course xcode 13 as well contains the log 4 vulnerability as apple has mentioned on their official website so it's bad i mean still people say that apple has pretty much passed it so it's not really exploitable but i mean the log 4 stuff this thing which has happened pretty much has set everything straight in a sense that you should be always always focusing a lot on security and especially corporates and companies who are using these projects which don't have a lot of maintainers which don't have a lot of budget but still are integral part of the ecosystem so that's like something we should be addressing together so here's someone who created a windows 11 ui using tailwind css and this is definitely interesting because people do all sorts of stuff i think the other day i was seeing some os which which was created from scratch in html css javascript and supported applications and this and that and all that stuff similarly this is also one of those examples maybe just layout but still is and uh, yeah i mean browser like we discussed i think in one of the videos as well is becoming a new operating system is becoming a place where people are running these experiments doing all sorts of stuff plus technologies like tailwind css really make it easy so if you missed out the recent announcement of the tailwind css free interactive course launched on code then make sure you check it out in some video i think a couple of videos ago but yep this is interesting and people keep on building these interactive these nice looking projects right so if you are someone who's trying to get into web development or looking for a fun project one fun thing could be taking the ui of a native app for example windows in this case 
Windows is not an app, but still, and then trying to build it within the browser itself. And people actually like that, right? You can see if you post it on subreddits, people actually like that you are working towards that particular thing. How modern or how appropriate is PHP? Now, this is one question which we have talked a lot about in the past as well, or uh, even did a complete video where the conclusion was that PHP is not irrelevant with newer PHP versions and newer support. It's obviously getting better and faster, but still in terms of modern it's fine but appropriate it depends on what kind of background you have if you're starting from scratch if you're starting fresh and if you don't have any problem learning any other language probably that might be a better way to go because the community is thriving for ecosystems like go and rust and node.js and uh, you know all these sort of things for php not so much you wouldn't see a lot of new things coming out in the php world but for node.js for example you will see dino as the competitor or you would see frameworks built on top of not exactly node but remix and next.js and stuff like this which inherently uses node so that particular thing is interesting about node and you know these popular python or these particular languages but for php it's it's mostly about trying to work with the engine itself and trying to work with the industry defined and standard framework so and this question actually goes a little bit into the sql injection part which definitely can happen with or without php right you can do a sql injections with node.js servers as well that's what pretty much the comments also go in right so like people say php is actually fine a lot of companies still use it so if you are learning it it's not a bad choice because you have so much code written in php already that we need a lot of developers to maintain upgrade and you know keep them performant but yeah i mean at the end of the day it's mostly about your choice how much you are comfortable with doing stuff with php this is an interesting question because i think a few days back i also saw a similar question asked in my comment section why does Vercel has a single ip address 76 76 21 21 and uh, that is because i mean of course google is using and this question is using a different architecture but for Vercel and things like these there are a lot of interesting solutions which again like the person says it starts with dns but there is also a concept of known as concept known as any cast ip addresses which means that you always get a single ip address for a particular service but that ip address is shared between multiple compute resources around the world right so if i'm browsing from india i might can get connected to a server which is sitting in delhi from that particular ip whereas if i'm browsing from united states that might be the closest server over there but the benefit of any cast ip address is you keep the ip address same that means your dns provider returns the same ip address but you actually get a different location which is served right so there are a lot of ways like dns is also one one way where you can provide a custom closest location of that particular server so that is one way load balances on you know non dns layers for example on http and tcp load balances so I mean, when you get to a scale like Google and, you know, Vercel even and Facebook and this and that, these things become really interesting because the amount of traffic these sites get is humongous and you absolutely cannot have a solution which, you know, is, is not optimized or is not thought through completely inside out. So this is why the problems solved by these companies in most cases are the solutions which are probably the best solutions available right now in the world. So it's always a good idea to search and, you know, see what these companies do in, in, in their organizations to get a glimpse of what happens large scale companies. And that's pretty much it for this video. I'm going to keep it short because I just want to get your feedback on how do you think we should proceed forward with this Reddit review and the subreddit review system. Leave some few subreddits which you think are active and are interesting as developers. I'm going to try to include them in our next subreddit review video. That is all for this one. I'm going to see you in the next video really soon. If you're still watching this video, make sure you comment down in the comment section. I watched this video till the end. Also, if you're not part of CodeDamp's Discord community, you're missing out a lot on events which we organize on a weekly basis to code. You already know the drill. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And thank you so much for watching.